My name is Mike Sellers. This is going to be a little bit more of a, an academic talk. Uh, I am a professor of practice uh, teaching game design. This talk is a condensation of a semester class that I teach. So we're going to cram an entire semester into about 25 minutes, which shouldn't be a problem at all, right? So these are the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to give you a very quick history of uh, what systems are, because I need to give you that basis to understand them uh, so we can go forward and talk more about the practical matters. We'll talk about why they're important, uh, and then really try and give a systematic description of systems, um, and then how we apply those uh, to games and, and even beyond games. So very quickly, systems, systems as a thing, as an a, a area of study, been around for a long time, going back to the ancient Greeks, the word systema uh, means a whole organized of parts, which is essentially what we still talk about with systems today. We've just gotten them a lot more fine-tuned than that. Um, the first big development uh, in the West in systems was Isaac Newton, uh, who uh, published the, his Principia Mathematica, which uh, the third volume which was entitled The System of the World. And it turns out this was the end of a long intellectual argument about whether there was one form of gravity on Earth and one form of gravity in the heavens, or whether there was one form of gravity overall. Um, Newton looked at uh, Halley's data for the moons of Jupiter. This will get back to games, I promise. Um, and was able to determine that there was one system of gravity. And he, this is where he derived his gravitational equation from. Um, this is also essentially the beginning of observational science in the West. Uh, it also took us down a road of being very reductionist and very, well, we can, we can reduce everything to an equation and it'll just be great because there is one system of the world. That turns out to be both a blessing and a curse. Um, Fast forwarding a whole lot, we go to the 20th century, and in the early, starting in the early 20th century, there was a, a big flowering of system, systems thinking in environmental and ecological sciences, in psychology, particularly in the Gestalt school. I'll just point out here that that white triangle in the middle doesn't exist, even though you all see it. Um, in biology, with things like termite mounds, how do termites manage to create a 12-foot tall mound like this? Uh, in computer science, uh, here we go, he's finally animating. Uh, this is from uh, Conway's Game of Life. This is the, the glider. Um, and even in business, uh, with things like uh, Fifth Discipline. So we've seen a lot of this uh, throughout the 20th century uh, really come to light in a lot of different areas. Um, and this is made inroads into game design. We certainly talk about systems a lot in game design. Uh, but we talk about combat systems and economic systems and various different kinds of systems. The thing is, we're all still doing this kind of tacitly. Um, the people I've talked to, and even myself, um, over the years, I realized we really don't think about a lot of what a system is and why it's important and what it really means in game design. So one of the things I'm trying to do here is to, to help uh, myself and help other people uh, create games more intentionally, to understand what it is we're doing more with games when we're designing them. Uh, this will enable better design and, I believe, uh, create more meaningful, more engaging games that people will play for longer. Uh, and not, incidentally, make us better designers along the way. So one of the ways to approach this is to understand that, uh, essentially, games are systems and that games have systems within them. And as players play a game, they encounter the, 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 the system that's in the game, and then they, they build a mental model of it in their head. And if that mental model mostly matches, you'll notice these don't exactly match, but that's okay. If they mostly match, they go, oh, I get it. I understand what's going on here. And that's the beginning of engagement. That's the beginning of fun. And you can build on that, and people will play the game for a long time. On the other hand, if the mental model they build is, does not match the model and the system that's in the game, then there's, they, there's a faulty mental model, and people feel like they've had their violations, uh, their, their expectations violated, um, and they said the game is less fun. Um, you, you, now, you do see some games that... Um, Dwarf Fortress or EVE Online, for example, where there's this, not a learning curve, there's more of a learning wall because the systems are, are opaque or very, very difficult to learn or inconsistent. And some people will stick with it, but the vast majority of people will say, nope, done. This is not, I, I can't make a mental model out of this, so uh, I have no idea what's going on here. So again, the, the point here being that we want to create better game systems so people will, will uh, want to play our games more. Now, as I've mentioned, uh, systems are, even after all the work that was done in the 20th century and, and early in the 21st century, still very prob problematic because the word itself is really vague. That's why I took us down that little history uh, lesson because I wanted you to understand where this came from. Um, there's also words we use like dynamics and emergence and complexity that have really strong, important meanings that we just use really loosely. And that's one of the things I want to get us past because I think if we understand what emergence is, if we understand what complexity is, and I've had to take most of the complexity out of this talk, uh, then we'll, uh, we'll be able to, to make better game designs. 
one of the big reasons for this is that systems don't fit into our reductionist way of seeing the world. There's a, a guy named John Nesbitt who did a, a famous set of studies uh, in the West and in Asia asking people, for example, what do they see in this picture? And what most people, particularly in the West, say is they'll say things like, oh, there's three big fish and a couple of stalks of plants, and maybe this is a frog and a snail. And what we're doing when we do this is we're calling out the things. We're calling out the little bits. We're not talking about the relationships between them. Now, it's a little more common in Asia for people to say, oh, this is an aquarium, or this is an undersea scene, and they talk about the relationships between the things. But even there, even um, in, in Japan, uh, of Japan, Korea, and China, Japan is uh, most likely, our pe people, people there are most likely to see this as an overall scene, again, as sort of a gestalt in the psychological terms. But even there, we don't, we don't see it that way. We tend to see the things. And this takes us back to this guy, the, uh, the glider from Conway's life. The question is, and it sounds like a really sort of abstract theoretical question, but is the glider a thing? And you can say, sure it is, it looks like a thing, it's obviously a thing, but then you can say, well, it's actually just these frames down here, and there's rules that are operating underneath there, very simple rules for Conway's life, so you can say, no, it's just these are different cells in a grid that are being lit up, it's not a thing at all, and yet we all experience this as a thing. I'll return to that in, in, a, in a couple of minutes here. Okay, so I want to now, with a very brief introduction, go into uh, defining systems as, again, sort of formally and systemically as I can in, in the time that we have here. Um, so, systems are made of parts, uh, and parts have internal attributes that define their internal state. Now, in, a ga in game terms, these might be like name value pairs, speed equals 6, hit points equals 20, whatever. If you know object-oriented programming, this should sound very familiar to you. You have objects, and they have attributes inside them, no problem. Um, objects or, or parts also have behaviors uh, that allow them to interact with other parts, and that's the magic right there in a nutshell. Um, Together, these, in, these integrate and exist as a whole. Now, again, there's a whole lot I'm skimming over here. Uh, for example, how do we know what a whole is and how do we know what a boundary is? That's actually a really important topic that we can take up later. But the, the important part here is that you have, um, you have parts that have internal state and that interact with other parts that also have internal state, and these create a whole. Now, another part of this is that each of these holes is itself each of these parts, excuse me, is itself a whole that kind of subsystems within it and that exists within a larger system. So you get this deep hierarchy. Um, in, uh, in, and so what we see is we have you know, parts within parts within parts, each interacting to form these overall wholes. And it's this organization, how things, how parts are connected, that creates the system. Now I said a minute ago you could have speed equals 6 and hit points equals 20. That's great in the game. Just as a side note, in reality, we have the same organization, but we don't see, there's no bottom as far as we can tell. It really is turtles all the way down. Um, atoms aren't small billiard balls. It goes down and down and down with the same pattern of parts and relationships all the way down. Now, getting back to sort of systems overall and in terms of games, it's these connections between parts that give us the key ability to have loops and in particular feedback loops. So there are two basic kinds of feedback loops that give us, very importantly, nonlinear results. So uh, you've probably heard the saying, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. That actually comes from early systems thinking in the 20th century in ecology, where people noted that um, not all relationships are simply additive, some are multiplicative. Uh, so that the sort of canonical example is, if you have a predator-prey relationship, uh, one uh, wolf takes out one rabbit, it's not, it's not subtract one rabbit. You have to actually subtract that rabbit and all the offspring it would have had otherwise. So you have a multiplicative relationship. And you can show very quickly that you get these overlapping sort of sinusoidal relationships uh, that are nonlinear. And the reason for this is that we have these two basic kinds of loops. You have reinforcing loops. This is essentially like the game of Monopoly, where the more money you have, the more property you can own, the more property you own, the more money you get. And this, uh, this accelerates on itself, as opposed to a more um, abstract balancing loop where uh, the more uh, markets you have, the more products you can sell, but the more products you sell, the less market you have left. And so this is what's called a limits to growth uh, curve, where it's, it's, you're not going to grow infinitely, it's going to balance itself out. And there are a lot of these uh, balancing loops or reinforcing loops, and these are, in a sense, sort of the two of the fundamental occurrences we have in game design. Um, and again, I'm trying to bring these out more explicitly. There are many, many kinds of these loops. Uh, one of the most important ones is the unintended consequences loop, where you have an inner loop, with a, a rising symptom and then a solution and then a delay, the little hash marks there indicate a delay with an unintended consequence. And there are lots of examples of this. One very quick one, um, it's not a, 
a documented story, but it's such a good story, I love it anyway. And the story is that in India, when uh, the British ruled there, they said there are too many cobras. And so they said, we will pay people for cobra heads. And so people start bringing in cobra heads, and soon enough, the cobras vanished, which was wonderful. So they had a symptom, too many cobras. The solution, bring us cobra heads. Great, fewer cobras, that's wonderful. But they noticed they kept getting cobra heads, even though no one could see any more, any more cobras. And they said, well, this is strange. What's going on? We're paying out way too much money for this. So they said, we're going to stop paying for cobra heads. So now the outer loop, the unintended consequences, was that people had said, naturally enough, wow, they're paying for cobra heads. I know what I'll do. I'll start farming cobras. And so then when the British said, well, we're no longer paying for cobra heads, they said, well, fine, I'm letting my cobras all go. And now you have more cobras than you had before. <laughs> and there is example after example after example, both in games and the real world of this kind of thing. Um, beyond that, we have, uh, this is a, a runaway or the rich get richer. Um, you can show that if, if you have two loops, A and B, both trying to do something and both having success, if the odds are just slightly in favor of A, then A will hyperbolically win and B will hyperbolically lose. Um, it's inevitable, but yet people go to Las Vegas anyway. Um, this, this also uh, shows up in a lot of older games. Uh, there's a game called uh, Rampart, the big arcade game back from the 1980s. That was fun enough when you're putting quarters in, the quarters being the balancing loop to this whole thing here. But once I could play it at home as many times as I wanted to, what you saw was if I won one game, against like one of my kids, I would win all the rest of the games because I, I was now going to, I had this 51% edge. Then we have things like uh, the tragedy of the commons, which you may have heard about, uh, two groups or two people, A and B, uh, both having some success, but they're both drawing from a common resource that they don't realize is going to ultimately limit their behavior. Again, we see this in a lot of, uh, a lot of games, a lot of MMOs. So these are just ways that we see uh, that we can represent loops in games. The other point that, that I wanted to raise here is that each of these things we see, the unintended consequences, the rich get richer, or the tragedy of the commons, what you're seeing here is parts interacting together to create at a higher level, this, this next level of organization up, a new property, a new effect. Uh, this is where we start talking about emergence. Um, oh, yeah, so parts continue, so they create new properties, right. So this is where we get to, we start talking about emergence. Now, emergence is one of these very squishy words. It's actually really useful and has a really good meaning. When you have an emergent effect, you have a property that's seen at one level of organization that is not seen at the level below. Um, so one of the sort of philosophical questions they ask is, how many molecules of water do you have to have before it becomes wet? And the, the question really is, when do fluid dynamics take over over, you know, over solid dynamics or uh, molecular dynamics? Um, anytime you have a situation like this where you have new properties that are found, you have emergence. So here we have, for example, a couple of flowers, a couple of leaves, and a butterfly and yet we all see a face, almost all of us, I'm sure, um, because we are biologically, the, the, the way our neurology works, we, we will see a face there, and yet there is no face there. It's the juxtaposition, the relationship of these, in this case, a spatial relationship of these parts, how they relate to, oh, that looks like a face to us. This creates a, a thingness, and unfortunately, we don't have a better English word than that. John Holland is a computer science researcher, actually just recently passed away, um, who his, his short definition of emergence was that when you have something where it's easier to define a, a, a thing at its higher level rather than in terms of its constituent parts, that's when you have an emergent property. So you say, oh, this looks kind of like a face. That's an emergent property. When we have the glider, it's easier for me to say, this glider always moves down and to the right than it is to talk about the individual cells affected by the individual rules. So I have a shorter, briefer, equally expressive um, explanation for this, and that makes it an emergent property. We see this all throughout the natural world. Um, fish, when they're um, confronted with a large predator, will try and all get to the center of the school as fast as they can. What happens is they form a sphere. Now, there's no fish in there saying, okay, guys, formation 43, make a sphere. There's, there's, no, there's no lead fish. They, they are all trying to do their own thing, but this creates this overall reality. We can say, hey, look, that, sc that school of fish looks like a sphere. This um, highlights that another big property of systems, which is they have distributed organized behavior. So there's no lead fish, there's no lead bird, there's no one in charge of the termite mound. Um, and we see this, for example, in hurricanes, which are highly organized, um, but obviously there's no water droplet leading the hurricane. Uh, I already mentioned termite mounds. And this is uh, a couple of things that are, it's called a murmuration of starlings. Um, they, they form really complex shapes, but again, the, no bird is in charge of what shape they form. And what's really interesting is if you take the paths of these birds and map them over time, 
they end up looking like neural pathways in the brain. So we're seeing the same kinds of organizational, uh, distributed organizational behavior throughout all different kinds of systems. Now, what this leads us to is that emergence always happens one level up in terms of organization. This, this, the, the school of uh, fish or the flock of birds or the neural pathways or the termite mound, these are all, um, you, you see those at one level up uh, where you have this organized behavior. These emerge and arise out of the subsystems interactions. Um, the meaning can never be found in the parts, and this is equally true of games. You say, this sword does six points of damage. Well, what does that mean? It's really hard to say in the abstract. You can't find it at that level. You have to look the next level up and the next level up beyond that. Beyond that. In terms of a game, the game system is not just the combat system and the economic system and you know, the armor system and the movement system. The ultimate system is the game plus the player. That's where your meaning arises. The more meaningful your game is, the more it, it grabs people cognitively and emotionally and socially and culturally, um, the more meaning they're going to find in the game, and the longer they will play it, and the more fun they'll, they'll find it. Now, I should note here, too, that not all games need to be meaningful, or at least in, in sort of a deep sense. Uh, Candy Crush is a terrific game that has a lot of meaning in its context. What you need to have, though, is a consistent system, a consistent men mental model, and a consistent meaning within the context of the game. Now, I will say, I believe that the, the more of these that you hit, the longer people are going to be are going to play it, and the more they'll 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 uh, be touched by it. Okay, so working with systems. This is where now that was the that was the theory part of the talk. Now we'll try and get down a little more practicality. Most of you probably know about uh, mechanics, dynamics, aesthetic. Uh, aesthetics is a, a seminal uh, paper. Um, there's another framework uh, that's uh, used in the educational field called, called fu function behavior structure (FBS). They're fairly equivalent, not exactly equivalent, but fairly equivalent. What I've done is, what I've been working on recently is taking those and some other things and bringing them together to talk about parts, loops, and holes. Now, I'm still working the terminology for this. Um, there's a lot to be said for mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics, as well as function behavior structure, but those, those also have a lot of freight, and a, lot of, a lot of problematic things with them. Um, so what I'm looking at and what I talk, want to talk about the rest of the time here is parts, loops, and holes, and how these enable us to really understand and to perform a systemic, a systemic approach to game design. So starting with parts, this are, these are the game's objects and their behaviors. Again, if you, if you know object-oriented programming, this should be pretty familiar to you. Uh, this is, as a lot of designers will say, this is the nouns and verbs of the game. Uh, what, what's in the game and what do they, what do, they do? the parts have to have behavior sufficient to create systemic effects. And this is a big one, and it's a very hard thing. You can't say, well, three is not enough, but four is. One behavior might be enough, but it has to be the right behavior. And it has to, inter it has to interact with other things in the game in the right ways to create emergent effects. Uh, the parts have to have internal state. They have to have some kind of attributes. And this is where the game is really grounded in reality. Uh, and this is one of the things I'll, I'll pick up again here in just a moment. This idea that a game is spreadsheet specific meaning that I know how to implement this game because I can reduce the parts of it to a spreadsheet. Now, the parts, is, that's, this is sort of the reductionist side. That's not a complete view of the game. We'll get to the rest in a minute. But this is a vital part of the game. If you can't implement the game, you can't produce it, and it just stays in your head forever, and that doesn't do anybody any good at all. Moving up a level, uh, I've got an example here using uh, Joris Dorman's uh, machinations. Uh, loops and other kinds of interactions, that they all ultimately reduce down to loops. Um, this is how parts of the game interact with each other. Um, now, this, this can also be uh, the user interacting with the game where the user and the game proper are the subsystems and they break down into their own subsystems. We see lots and lots of these uh, different kinds of, of feedback loops. I covered a few, uh, few of them a few minutes ago. But we talk about engine building games or a blue shell mechanic. Uh, these are examples of how different parts of a game interact with each other to create different behaviors. Uh, another big one is complementary roles. Um, you don't want everyone to be a tank. You know, you have a, a tank, a DPS, you have crowd control. There's a lot of different paradigms or archetypes for different kinds of, of roles. Um, even if you have, uh, for example, this is from an um, early 1970s military, U.S. military training document where they have rock, paper, scissors actually institutionalized in, in military strategy. Um, and this, uh, this calls out the, uh, the notion of both complementary roles and what's called perfect imbalance. So that, for example, any two of these are completely imbalanced. Uh, you know, rock will always be scissors. Scissors will always, always be paper. They're completely imbalanced. But together, the emergent property is that they are all balanced. And, and so no, no pair of them are balanced, but all together they are balanced. Um, that is, a, that is a, a way of getting uh, overall balance from internal imbalance that is really elegant, although it's worth pointing out that this form of sort of rock, paper, scissors, you know, we all say RPS, 
that is itself so well known now that it is, um, it's almost too neat. And so uh, what a lot of games are showing is if you need to find other ways to imbalance things. So there are, you can do, for example, this. Rock, paper, lizard, rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock. Uh, takes the same thing, but just expands it out. And you can see, again, we have the same immersion effects where overall it's balanced, even though no two pairs are, are balanced. Now, moving on to holes, from parts to loops to holes, this is the totality of the game, the, the, what the player experiences, um, what they think, what they feel, what they learn from playing the game. This is where, I, going back to what I said a few minutes ago, that meaning emerges from the system of the game plus the player where the player, neither one of them is a, they're, they're both subsystems within the overall system, and of course they have subsystems within them. The thing you need to realize is that players will create meaning about your game whether you like it or not. Um, when I worked on, on The Sims and The Sims 2, we were baffled at first at the stories people were telling and really creating of whole cloth because the stories were not in the game at all. But players told wild stories about the game that they made up. They found their meaning in the game. And some of them were love stories, and some of them were tragedy stories, and some of them were stories about serial killers. Uh, because people will do that with any game. Um, so if people are going to put in meaning whether you like it or not, you might as well, again, design the game intentionally and say, here is what I as the creator think that the meaning should be, but each of you are going to have to choose what you think the meaning is. Uh, but if you, if you don't put that in there, then it's just going to be sort of up to them what they decide. Okay, having reviewed those, the next point I want to make is that as designers, it's really vital that we each know uh, what, where our strengths are. Uh, I asked uh, a bunch of uh, game designers what they thought a systems designer was, and Paul Stefan came up with this, which I thought was great. A systems designer can turn a spreadsheet into a game and a game into a spreadsheet. And I think that this really encapsulates for me the, the task that we have as designer, which is to keep the reduction parts of the poll, uh, the parts, the interactions of the loops and the experience are part of the whole in our head at the same time. If you ever say, oh, my game is all about nouns and verbs, you're losing the experience. If you say, oh, my game is going to make people weep with joy, well, how are you going to implement that? You have to keep these things in your head at the same time. The second part is, uh, I get asked this a lot, which do I need to start with? Do I start with the parts? Do I start with the nouns and verbs? Do I start with the experience? I believe, I firmly believe, as I've done all three of these, that you can start with any one. You can go from parts to holes, holes to parts, or even in the middle, uh, start with the, the, with the loops and the interactions and go say, well, I, I know what the dynamic is here. I know what the loops are. What are the parts that, that make that up? And what's the experience I'm trying to get to? I've got several designs in my head and sketched out that I still don't know what the experience is. And I won't be able to make the game until I do. But the point is that these are all... Um, equivalent, and you need all of them, but there is no one right way. So if you ever find yourself getting stuck, one of the things I found is you can say, okay, I'm going to leave that aside for now, and I'm going to move on to another part of this. And even more importantly, if I find that I'm much more at home in talking about the experience of the game, but it sounds, all sounds very sort of airy and it's, it's not grounded, I need to go find someone who can say, hang on, I can do spreadsheets really well. I can make your parts for you. Or vice versa, if you find someone who says, I've got a great idea, I know what these parts are, I just don't know what they do together or what the experience is. That's okay, there's somebody else who can help you with this. This is a, a place where I've had a lot of success with my students where they were really feeling kind of adrift, like I'm no good as a game designer, which I think is something that most, if not all, game designers feel at various points, maybe all the time, um, because there's some part of this I'm not getting. And someone will say, oh, oh, I can help you with that, because this is a part that I do really, really well. So working with people with, who have strengths that complement yours, which, by the way, is another instance of you each being a part that is interacting with another part to make a whole system in your game. Okay, so here are some questions that I wanted to uh, offer up for, um, that again, I use with my students, with myself, to just as sort of checkpoints. So in terms of parts, are, have you defined the parts of your game? Do you know what the hierarchy is? How do the parts fit within parts fit within parts? Do you know what their attributes are? What their internal state, states are? And in particular, what their behaviors are? Can these be implemented? This is something that I've seen stop people cold. You say, that sounds great. Can you implement it? Well, sure. Okay, how? Well, I don't really know. Okay, if you can't get it down to a spreadsheet or to at least words in a Word document, you can't implement it yet. You have to, you have to be careful about the, the hand-waving. Uh, and then do the parts have both methods and reasons to interact with each other to create significant effects. There's a lot of games I see where the, the parts are all atomistic. And like you say, 
Uh, these are all different forms of attacks. Okay, do they, do they interact with each other at all? Do they, do they help the players interact with each other at all? No, they all just do damage. That's a very, again, a very reductionist, very atomistic approach and doesn't give you the, the, the uh, interactions between things that you need. And this does include, by the way, the, as we say, the knobs and dials for the user interface. How does the player interact with your game? Another important one is, are the parts equivalent and unbalanced? And this is a really important one. Um, you want to make sure you don't have, uh, if you get this weapon, you can beat everything in the game. That's unbalanced, that's not perfect imbalance, that's extremely imperfect imbalance. Um, or I'll see sometimes when someone says, well, literally or metaphorically, I've got a flock of birds, and this is the lead bird. This is the one that decides for everybody else, as opposed to them all working together. Um, and again, is there perfect, imbalance, perfect imbalances between the parts? This is really important to get. If you get that, then you can move on to loops, um, where you, um, uh, you can say, do we have adequate feedback between the loops um, so that we get complex behavior. Now, I haven't had time to cover the difference between complicated and, com and complex. In one sentence, a complicated process is one that's serialized. So you have A causes B causes C. These almost never happen in the real world, and yet we keep trying to force them on the real world. A complex thing is A affects B, which affects C, which affects A again. So all the loops I've shown you in this, in this presentation. When you have complexity, that's when you get interesting interaction and emergence. And the thing, one other point of this is that... Um, Typically, we just, I'm on the edge of saying we as humans are just not wired to see emergence this way without experiencing itself. We can't see it very well in advance. Some of us as game designers can see it better than others, but typically you need to have playtesting to really get this. Uh, so does a system create a space or a path? Do you have a wide variety of interactions that will, that will react well no matter what the player does, no matter what the conditions of the game are? Or if the player does one wrong thing, does the game fall over? Um, and does the player make meaningful decisions? If they don't make any meaningful decisions, there's really not a, a game there. Uh, but this requires a lot of interactivity loops on a lot of different levels. And finally, coming to holes, um, is there a cohesive experience that the player has, or is it kind of a hodgepodge kind of experience? Um, and is that experience that you hopefully intended from the very beginning supported by the loops and the parts within the loops uh, that make up the game? And really what this amounts to is, does the game have a heart? And really, does the experience mean anything to the player? Now, again, it can be, it means what Tetris means when I get one of those long blocks in and get four rows. That's great. There's a, a, a tiny spark of meaning there. Or does it mean something when I have to abandon the, you know, have to destroy the companion cube and portal? That's a much larger set of meaning, and there are larger sets of meaning still. But this is something you as a designer have to decide. Does it mean what you intended it to mean? Okay, last couple of points here. This all sounds great, I hope, um, but we, you know, so the question is, why is this so rare? Why don't we see this more often? Uh, one of the big reasons is it seems very risky. It's much, much easier to build one-off content. We say, this specific content I'm going to build is for this specific case, and then when it's done, we'll never see it again. That's a very expensive, very brittle solution, as opposed to saying, let me make a system that can be resilient to all the different things that the user might do. It's also very difficult to see what's going on in a system when it's in progress. It doesn't look like anything until it's done or very nearly done. This is also why playtesting is so important. But it also means you can go for a long time with, with, it doesn't quite gel yet. And then as a result of this, it requires a lot of iteration and a lot of failure. And you have to be willing to, to, to fail at it. And if you're working in a company, your company has to be willing to have the time and be able to have the time to let you fail at it until you can make something really work. And then finally, if you're a designer, and you're doing systemic design, you are on the back side of a magic trick, which means that once you understand the system, it no longer feels like emergence to you. It no longer feels like magic to you. And this is a very difficult place to be because you say, oh, this isn't any good at all. And people say, no, this is terrific. This is great. And they, your players may actually see things in it that you don't see because you're seeing, again, sort of the back side of the magic trick. Quick advantages, uh, you get key, as, uh, things I've said here already. You get cohesive deep design, which gives you more engaging gameplay. Um, as you build immersion effects, as we've seen in a lot of the quote-unquote roguelike games, you get endless gameplay as you can recombine these things together. And this keeps you out of the static and very expensive content creation trap. It allows people to play your game, have more engagement, play your game longer, and, and eventually make more money. Final thought I want to leave you with. The reason I think this is so important is not just because I think it's important for game design, which I do, but that I believe systems thinking is vital for us in the 21st century well beyond games. 
but that also to understand systems, to be able to, to think in systems, you have to experience them. And nothing else that we know of gives people the ability to experience systems like playing or designing games. So I believe that designing games from a systemic point of view enables us to see more systems in our daily lives, which is why I started off with the real world examples in the first place. I think that we, by doing this, by using systemic thinking in, in game design, we can make better, better games and even better people. Thanks very much. These are just a few of the sources I used in case you're, you're interested. So, any questions? So, uh, my question is, could you clarify the strategy of the Commonwealth? And my second part is, is your research available online? Sorry, the strategy of the? The strategy of the Commonwealth. Oh, oh, oh the strategy of the Commons. Yeah. Oh, commons, yeah. So this, uh, very quickly, this goes back to, I think, England, uh, where they had you know, a, a Commons. A lot, of European countries had a, com a lot of European countries had a Commons where people could, could graze their sheep. The problem is, if everyone grazes their sheep and no one takes care of it, the Commons goes away and now no one can use it. Um, so you see this in, in a lot of situations in real life, and in some situations in, in games, for example, if a lot of people are camping a spawn in a game, uh, in an MMO, pretty soon that, it, that spawn is effectively available for no one, unless they do things like queue up, like we used to in some of the old MMOs. And uh, none of this is available online yet, uh, but I'm working on it. Awesome. I should say none of this except for all of this is available online. These are all great papers online. Thank you for a very nice speech, and I'll go on the internet and try to steal your slides in different <laughs> ways. Um, so, could you say something about, would you argue that you should think this way when designing all types of games, or is this good or better or worse for some genres of games? I will go out on a limb and say I think this is applicable to any kind of game. I can't think of a game, a kind of game that I've encountered where it isn't applicable. Now, I will say that some kinds of games have their form pretty well decided. Uh, I worked on a slot machine game, uh, and that the form for that is very well decided, and there's a lot of mathematics involved. But even there, we had to think about what is the player's experience, and what, what kind of experience we're we trying to give them, and even you, you have to dice it down more slowly, more finely. What's their experience in the first 30 seconds, and then in the in the next hour, in the next five minutes? You know, all these there's different ways of slicing that up. And that determines, okay, exactly how do we implement the game on the inside, and what are the dyna dynamics of that. So um, I do believe that because games are fundamentally interactive, and because the games are fun, I, I had to take out my whole interactivity chapter, uh, but because games are about the interaction between the players together, or player and the game, that you inevitably have this hierarchy of parts and loops within other parts and loops, so you're, you end up coming back to systems. I have yet to see a game, uh, if anyone has an example, I'd love to see one, a game that does not have any systems in it. I don't believe it exists, but I'd be lovely to be proved wrong just because I think it's, you know, that'd be the platypus. Yep, thank you. I think the time is up, right. but thank you so much for a really thank interesting talk. Thank you all. Talk.